So we're going to we're going to uh, take a step back from all of the, the good information that we've been hearing. We're going to wax philosophical for a bit. Um, so who am I? So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of context for, for where I'm coming from. Um, I'm the oldest child of five. I come from a massive Italian family. Um, I've been married for seven years. I'm a proud parent of two teenagers, uh, a stepdaughter of uh, that's 23 and two very large lap dogs. Um, I actually started my professional career cleaning houses, Kmart toilets, and making custom cabinets. So very non-technical related fields. And, and for the last 20 years, um, I've been working in IT, and I've been focusing on everything from support um, to quality, to testing, to agile coaching, and most recently, uh, more focused around the operational side of things. Um, and currently, I'm, I'm actually the director of IT operations for a local nonprofit called Waterford Institute, and we make uh, software learning platforms for uh, little kids. So that's me. Um, how many of you have read the Art of Secretary? Awesome, so you again. So some of you might be familiar with that. Um, it's, it is a, a novel that was written in the 70s by uh, a guy named Robert Persig. And it's, it's a little bit of philosophy around the pursuit of quality and what that is and delving into value and how that impacts quality. And um, as many of my colleagues reminded me of while I was, was preparing for this, um, Personally, it actually went kind of crazy trying to define quality and figure that out. So for those of us who have, have tried to define that over the years, and that quality has been our business, um, we can relate. So um, I will admit to being a little crazy. <laughs> um, all right, so before we get too far into it, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about quality. Um, just touch on it a little bit. So, first it says, the test of the machine is the satisfaction it gives you. Uh, there isn't any other test. If the machine produces tranquility, it's right. If it disturbs you, it's wrong. And so either the machine of your mind changed, or your mind is changed. So, the interesting thing is, um, he wrote this before software was even a thing. Um, but it applies to, to just about everything. And, and um, when I think about quality, I think about it as more of an art form. Um, and so that's why I shared one of my favorite uh, paintings here from Beth Van Gogh. Because when you look at software applications, um, much like a piece of fine art, um, you look at it and you, you know, right? You innately know uh, whether it's, it's good or bad. Um, whether it's a piece of fine art or whether it's just something that should be put away and never look at it again. And the same, the, the same goes for software, right? When we're looking at a piece of software application, we know within the few, first few minutes uh, of playing around with the software, whether that software is worth our time or not. Uh, and and that's, that goes for all of us. That goes for, for us who are in technology and working with software every day. And it also goes for our customers. So these, these concepts of quality, and DevOps, um, as we've learned over the past couple days, are, are pretty abstract, right? They're, they're really hard to kind of put your thumb on and, and get really concrete about. Um, and, and so, you know, as I was going through and I was, was thinking about quality and thinking about all I could learn from this book and how it applies to DevOps, um, I realized, well, okay, so I'm applying abstract concepts to abstract concepts, and so, but <laughs> we'll try to define DevOps a little bit. Um, Jez Humble, who happens to be uh, quite a big deal in the world of continuous delivery, um, defines DevOps as a cross-disciplinary community of practice dedicated to the study of building, evolving, and operating rapidly changing resilient systems at scale. That's possible. Um, that's pretty good. Um, Agile admin at Agile admin. So DevOps is the practice of operations and development and engineers participating together in the entire system life cycle from the design to development process to production support. Yeah, pretty close. I think that, that sums it up. 
my personal take on it is it's a bunch of really smart people from very diverse backgrounds and disciplines working together, aligning philosophies and goals, and making kick-ass software for people um, to love and use. So, you can quote me. So, what are we really striving for? What's the end goal here? Well, we're looking for faster delivery, right? Because businesses love faster delivery um, because they get a faster return, right? It means more money, more revenue. They can do more. Um, reducing downtime. Customers hate downtime. They hate it. Um, we hear about it um, in operations probably more than most, right? So, um, less downtime means happier customers um, and, and less risk of downtime since so we can keep these systems up for, our, uh, for the people that matter. Um, increasing quality. This is, this is for all of the testers out there, right? This is, this is all of the ability, the reliability, the, the efficiency, the supportability, the scalability, the security, um, any number of, of these abilities that we have to focus on um, as we're looking at testing our, our systems. Measurable value. Um, so we like to know whether we're meeting the mark, right? We, we want to know that what we're putting out there is valuable to our customers. And again, going back to high quality. Um, also, we want faster feedback. We want to, if we're going to fail, we want to fail fast. We want to fail cleanly and safely. And we want to file smartly so that we're getting the feedback that we need from that at the time it's happening and we can act on it. Um, and, and most importantly, um, all of this helps us be more agile and responsive to our customers, right? Um, because at the end of the day, we're all in pursuit of uh, working together towards these common goals and delivering value um, for our customers at the times that they need it. And, and that time, more and more, is happening more quickly in this fast-paced technology environment. So how are we doing right now? Well, the reality is, is that those who are practicing DevOps um, are, are experiencing some really, really great values from it. Um, so we're, we're kind of between um, inadequate and awesome, somewhere in there, I think, is, is where we fit. Um, Puppet actually did a study in 2016 of the state of DevOps, and they surveyed 25,000 IT professionals, and they found that those who are actually using DevOps um, in their environments, they're deploying 200 times more often, they're experiencing three times fewer failures, um, and those failures that do happen, happen 20, or they're able to resolve 25% faster, or 25 times faster. Um, they're spending 50% less time fixing security issues, and they're spending 22% less time on unplanned work and pre-work, um, that technical debt that gets all of us. Um, on the opposite side of that, um, I also found a number of studies that were a little bit smaller, but were more focused towards the IT leadership and directors and executives. And their findings were that four out of five businesses are using these, and they and eighty one percent of them find the value and see the value, um, but only a third have actually deployed them fully and standardized those across their organizations. So we haven't quite gotten to the point where we've made this, um, we've rolled this out for organizations in a way that they're able to reap some of these benefits. Um, so in short, those who figured out how to do it effectively um, seem to be experiencing that end that we're raising for, right? And, and the reality is there are still a lot of organizations um, who haven't figured it out yet. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do. And that's why events like these are so important, right? Because we can come together and, and each one of you can take all of the information that we get from here and take it back to your teams and make things happen. So what's getting in our way? Well, Tech Republic ran a survey uh, in 2016 with one of their partners, and they identified the top 10 challenges to implementing DevOps. And as I was looking at these, um, I was able to kind of put them into three different buckets here. I was able to put them into cultural, technology, and operational factors. So you have, you've got your cultural factors, right? You've got your segmented teams who just don't want to talk to one another. Um, they're very, anti one another and, and they just kind of want they want to leave each other alone, right? 
right? Um, not much collaboration happening there. Um, you've got executives who really don't know what DevOps is, and, it, and they hear it as a buzzword, and sometimes they're, you know, they kind of want to get on board, but they're not quite sure what that means. And, and in many cases, they look at it as, oh, this is just our IT team spending more money, right? Um, which, working for a nonprofit, I can speak to that, that they're always going to say no. <laughs> Unless you come at them with a, with, with a, a good story for it, right? Um, limited influence of evangelists, right? There, there aren't enough of us. So that's, again, why these types of, work, these types of gatherings are so important. Um, we need more people like you, more practitioners, more people who are willing to go out there and evangelize about this stuff. And um, this line goals. Um, a lot of us have work on teams that have their own goals, their own timelines, their own focus, and a lot of those aren't anywhere near each other. Uh, and that's causing a lot of problems. Um, then you have the technology factors. You've got all of those legacy monolithic systems that we've tried to, to convert to SaaS models. Um, if, to, if you guys have any experience like, like mine, um, we have taken a very old program and we've, we've tried to convert it into a SaaS uh, infrastructure. And, and that has uh, been limiting and, and has caused a lot of issues. Um, there's a lot of complexity in architecture and infrastructure, and there is a lack of automation. Um, even with all the tools today, we still have a, a lack of automation in the right areas. Um, and then you have your operational bucket, which, you know, you, you have a lot of lack of competency in your team. These are day-to-day -day operations. Um, and then you have no formal plan for implementation. You have no one who's sitting here looking at the entire thing of what needs to be done and laying out what it's going to take to get there. And then you have a lack of centralized governance and standardization, right? Getting back to, to that problem where it, this isn't being rolled out broadly enough to make a big enough impact. So when I was looking at these problems, um, I realized it's really important for us to think about um, these problems both independently and as a group, because the way we think about these problems are fundamentally going to impact the way that we solve them. And when I was looking at these problems, I, I came to the realization that these actually are all people problems, um, every single one of them, which is good in some ways because it means we actually have control over that, right? We have the ability to make some real change here. And so I came up with the pyramid of DevOps awesome. Um, which breaks it down into those three key areas. And as you can see, you've got that fundamental culture piece of it at the base of that pyramid, because it is the, by far the largest part of it, and it's the, the place that we need to focus most. So, let's talk about culture for a minute. Persick says, the place to improve the world is first in one's own heart and head and hands, and then work out for it. So we get to be a little more introspective. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means we need to stick, take a step back individually and we need to look at ourselves and the role that we play in making DevOps successful in our organizations, in, in adding value, right? Um, what that means is we have to know our world. We have to know our domain and we need to own that world. We need to raise that bar for ourselves and change our focus and energy onto the things that really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, we need to lead and we need to influence by example. Instead of trying to convince people that stuff works, we need to just start doing it, start acting, and show people that it works. So I encourage all of us, including myself, to take what we've learned here and personally commit to those changes that have to happen and, and take action. Um, even the little stuff, right? It starts to add up. So then you look at, well, then you go from transforming yourself, and then you have your team, right? That's the other piece of this. Um, Robert, Robert Persick says, is it hard? Not if you have the right attitudes. It's having the right attitudes that's hard. And so there's a transformation that has to happen at the team level. Today, um, this is what it looks like 
in many operations groups, right? Um, or in, in many IT groups. You've got your ops guys over here, you've got your dev guys over here, and you've got your test guys over here. And, you know, they do their own things, they have their own agendas, they have their own strategies, um, and there's just not, not a whole lot of collaboration and understanding of each other. So, what we need to do is we need to start building confidence between these guys and start cultivating trust and align all of them into one so that they can kind of develop empathy. And so what this does is this allows the teams to be, you know, this allows the team to have their focus and their strength areas, right? So you've got, you know, Joe Schmo over here in ops, who his focus is ops, right? That's what he's focused on. Um, but he can start learning things about testing. He can start learning things about that. Um, and in doing so, he's going to become a little more empathetic to their world. And the same goes for your dev guys and your tech guys, right? Um, they all have the opportunity to learn from each other. And in many cases, when you do this and you start opening up those doors and opening up, opening up those lines of communication, you start seeing that we don't have the same problems fundamentally, right? So, um, and then you've got the security guy over here, right? Because we're still working on that. I mean, security, we, we start talking about it. We, we, we've had a couple conversations about it uh, today and yesterday. But he's still over here. Um, and that I, I believe that's going to be a huge player moving forward. Um, as we see a lot more of these threats become um, public news, right? It, this is a big deal. And so the security kind of needs to come into that and kind of um, be a part of that collaborative mindset. Um, so what else? Well, so we need our DevOps champions. So yes, yes, you can be a uniform. <laughs> so the reality is, is that um, it takes champions to make this happen. It takes people getting out there and starting and having the right conversations start the right activities, getting people talking, getting people excited <laughs> about this stuff, right? Um, by the way, as I was looking up this this image, I, I just give you fair warning, looking up men dressed like unicorns. <laughs> so but but who are your DevOps champions? Your DevOps champions are those who they know their realm, right? They're confident in their realm. They've been doing this a long time. They're they're in in the trenches doing this every single day. Um, and these are people that often, you know, despite all of us kind of being introverts, they're the ones that are breaking out of their comfort zone, and they're not they're not shying away from things like mentoring um, and collaborative thinking and getting in a room with people. Um, these are the people that, that are willing to go out on a limb and push back on nonsense because there is a lot of nonsense, right? It, we all face it. It happens. Um, having someone who's, who's willing to go into a room full of senior leadership and say, you know what? We're going down the wrong path, guys. We need to refocus and come back to what's important. Um, pushing back on the nonsense is so important. Um, these are the players that you want to put on a pedestal. And the reason you want to put them on a pedestal is because you want others to flock to them, right? You want others to be like them. Um, because if you can get everybody kind of feeling excited about that and, and being like a unicorn, um, then you have everybody getting, you know, kind of joining forces. Um, and, and it has, you start to see some of that alignment happen kind of naturally and more organically. Um, and not only does it happen horizontally in the IT organization, but you'll also see it extend out to your business groups and you'll see it go vertically. So you'll have senior leadership all the way down to um, your, your individual contributors, all aligned, which is just quite an incredible thing for that in IT. So at the end of the day, you, you can never have too many. There is always room for another uniform in the world. All right, so moving on to organizational transformation. So th this, is, this sort of gets a little bit difficult, right? But the reality is that we have to kind of look at organizations um, like really complex systems, because that's what they are. Um, all organizations are, 
are collections of people and process, right? And so making change at, at that organizational level kind of requires a, a top-down and bottom-up approach. You need to have people at the top kind of thinking about these things and supporting and creating the atmosphere that, that allows these groups to fail and learn from their experience and to experience and come up with new ideas. And then you also need drivers from the bottom going, hey, this is what we want to do and here's why. Um, so one of the interesting topics that Persick um, goes into is he likens an organization to Manhattan, right? You have, you have Manhattan that's there, an incredibly complex system. You have, you know, tons of people. You have all of these underlying systems, like the electrical work, you have these underlying metro systems, you have, you have plumbing, you have all of these intricate systems. And it just kind of happened organically, right? It's, it's made up of all of these subgroups. Um, and so that's kind of how he likes to, likes to think about organizations. And that can really help us, um, because it allows us to realize that we actually are changing the organization by operating at these lower levels. Um, one point on the leadership part of this, uh, one of the nice things is if you can be in an organization where you have leaders who are not only humble, but also have that professional will and that gumption um, to kind of take the, the organization forward. And those leaders who also nurture at every level, right? Um, you know, they take that open door policy to the next level in terms of not only recognizing and acknowledging um, their individual contributors, but realizing that that higher level does not exist without those lower players. And that's, and that's a really important part of creating the space for this type of magic to happen. So what you get, hopefully, at the end of all of this, is you get a cycle of transformation. You've got individual transformation happening, and then that's feeding into your team transformation, and then you get your operation for your organizational transformation, and then that starts feeding back into the individual and into the teams, right? And so it's the cyclical type movement, and it becomes an engine for the change that you want to see. Um, Persig says, peace of mind produces the right values, right values produce right thoughts, right thoughts produce right actions, and right actions produce work, which will be a material reflection for others to see of the serenity at the center of it all. And, and it, it's kind of true, right? When you start seeing this type of magic happen, it almost feels effortless. Right? It feels like everything's moving, kind of grooving, and people are working together, and things are happening. And, it, and it, it's, it's that zen mentality, right? It kind of feels like, yeah, this is good. We can actually make this happen. So I, I do want to talk, talk about communication, because communication is a big part of this. Um, Persig talks, talks about it a little bit. He says, we're in such a hurry most of the time, we never get much chance to talk. The result is an endless day-to-day -day shallowness, a monotony that leaves a person wondering where all the time went, and sorry that it's all gone. And the irony of that statement is that he actually wrote that before we had social media, before we had cell phones, before we had, you know, we were sitting in front of instant messengers and email. Um, so you can imagine that's even more applicable to today. The challenge is, is you, I mean, you really do have to get all of these, these introverts who are not comfortable talking face to face to, to start talking and start having those conversations. And, and that's a really, really hard thing to do. And the only way you can, you can't force it, right? You can't, you can't go into a room and say, hey, all of you guys need to start talking together and expect all of them. That just to change overnight. It just, it just, I've tried it actually. Um, so, what, but what we can do is, it, I, I did a little bit of research on this topic, and there seems to be a common trend. So, the majority of people in these companies recognize that collaboration needs to happen. So, you know, even those of us who this doesn't, this isn't second nature, we realize that we should be talking to each other. Um, and the interesting thing is that they also recognize that if we don't talk to each other, that we're not going to have those successful outcomes, and it's going to be reasons for failure. And yet, 
Only a small percentage of us are actually willing to get out of our seat and make this stuff happen, right? We continue to hide behind our IM and we continue to hide behind our emails and, and you know, have very long discussions and a very long email thread. <coughs> that, but um, as the unicorns that I'm hoping you all will be, whether you decide to dress as unicorns or not, is to lead by example. Um, take the opportunity to get your booty out of your seat and go talk to people. Um, and, and that means looking for opportunities to make that happen, right? So if you see an email thread where, you know, you, you've got back and forth and back and forth and it's more than three emails in and you should be getting people into a room, right? To, to talk about whatever, whatever it is. Um, even if it's a quick 10 minute visit, um, just that face to face can really change the outcome and make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, if you set the bar higher for yourself and you're taking it upon yourself to set this example um, and, and start inviting others to do that with you, you'll start to see it get change. It's slow, but you will start to see some of that change. The other thing you can do is as a leader, and, and please keep in mind, I'm speaking as a, as a leader here. I spend most of my days working with teams of DevOps people, working with teams of engineers, working with teams of IT um, people who just, you know, we're all socially awkward, right? <laughs> so, um, as a leader, it's incredibly important to make sure that we're promoting and acknowledging and rewarding um, moments when that type of collaboration happens, right? So if you see, you know, Joe email over here and you see him get out of his seat and go have a conversation, acknowledge it. Make sure that you're, you're celebrating that moment because chances are that moment will happen again. And it is kind of a kind of a snowball effect. Um, what this starts doing is you start having, instead of individual successes, you start getting people experiencing shared successes, which is an incredibly powerful force for influence. Um, you start getting knowledge sharing. People start talking, people in operations start talking about testing, and people in development start going, wait, maybe I should think about security, and, and maybe, wait, does my application actually scale? Um, it, these kinds of conversations start happening, and then you start getting transparency, right? So it becomes even more transparent to the organization. And, and at the end of the day, you have confidence and you have trust that wasn't there before. So it's a big deal in terms of making, making our, our environments a safe place for that to happen. And that also means that when people do make a stand and when people do come out, we need to make it safe, right? If, they, if someone comes out and, and challenges something, right, challenges nonsense in a public forum, and they are automatically shut down, guess what happens? Anybody know? What happens? You'll never hear from that guy again, ever. He'll go back to his desk, and he'll just carry on the status quo, right? So we as leaders really need to be able to, to recognize those scenarios and and help nurture those scenarios. All right, so I feel like I have to call this out because this is a skill that we really struggle with as a society. Um, we have a lot of really smart, talented people working for us, right? And there are a lot of smart, talented people in this room. And each individual is a bundle of their unique experiences, their unique perspectives, and their unique skill sets. Some of those are soft, some of those are technical, you name it. And, and they're just untapped potential waiting to be opened up. And the only way we're going to know and learn about these potentials is if we get to know them on a personal level. So take the opportunity to ask about these people. Ask how they got into IT and technology. Ask what, what gets them excited about stuff, right? We, we need to know what drives the individual so that we can know how to kind of bring them into this movement. Um, and finding, finding common ground um, on a personal level, it, it actually opens the door for a lot of these harder conversations, right? 
So if we can connect with someone on a personal level, it's going to make it a lot easier when we're firefighting and we're in a room and we're in a war room and, and we're going back and forth over a production issue that's taken our system down and we've got to get it back online because we're losing millions of dollars every moment that that system is down. Um, it's going to make those moments a lot easier to handle and a lot more productive. Okay, so moving on to operations. So first it says, you look at where you're going and where you are, and it never makes sense. But then you look back at where you've been, and patterns start to emerge. So in his discussions about quality, first he categorizes, he categorizes quality into two different types, dynamic quality and static quality. And that quest for quality ends up being about breaking established patterns and behavior and ruts uh, that we find in our earlier nation. And being brave enough to forge new paths. And that can be really, really tough. But the reality is, is once you start doing it, it actually becomes a little bit easier and a little bit easier. And as that culture kind of opens up, um, once things start, start moving, they end up keeping moving. And so as you look, look for ways to transform your operation, um, what I have found to be most successful is to take a step back and really look at the organization holistically and identify the top five problems that are impacting the team's ability to deliver value, right? What are the top five things that keep coming up every single day? Um, and then make sure that that's where we're focusing our process and our procedure and our new operation, operational paths that we put into place. So all, all of our activities should be focused around kind of fixing those, right? And once you prove that those processes are effective, once you put them in place, you've tested them, people are, are following them, and, and you're starting to see them be successful, kind of work the kinks out, then move on to the next five steps, right? So look at it like you're building a strong foundation, not only for business growth, but for your team to, to kind of grow as well and mature. All right, tools and automation. This is the slide. But um, tools are important. We've seen their vendors are here. Um, thank you to all the vendors here. The, the tools are incredible today, right? We have all kinds of, of things that, to help us automate um, our world and make our day to day a little bit easier. And man, IT people love their toys, right? We love our tools. We love learning new tools. We love learning new ways to do things. And man, once those shiny new tools come out, our attention goes <laughs> right over to it. And the reality is, just like everything else in the DevOps world, we actually have to stop and center ourselves again and start weighing the value of, of what we're automating and why and making sure that whatever we automate is the right thing to automate and that it's actually going to add value to our organization instead of jump, jumping in full, full swing into an implementation and then realizing three quarters in that you actually think it's not cool. Um, one of the things that I've found to be very helpful is to automate the stuff that's been proven um, and the stuff that is the most repetitive. Um, that, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, that drags the team down and the team is just having to do all the time, whether that be testing or, um, you know, daily scripts that, that um, capture logs or whatever it may be, right? Um, you, you should be qualifying every initiative against that bigger vision and making sure that um, we're not getting caught by that shiny new toys that go down. So one of the, I do want to touch on constraints, because um, we talked about it a, a little bit, um, but constraints are, are a very real thing. Uh, I think one of the things, especially working for a nonprofit, uh, I've experienced is that there's never enough time, there's never enough resources, and we've always got a full backlog of work to, to keep us busy for some of the next five years. And, and as we go, I'm sure we'll add, you know, a whole other layer. Um, but 
I really tried to stay, in, in my talk today, I'm trying to stay away from specific do's and don'ts um, because for a very simple reason. Each environment, each company has, it is their own unique entity, unique organism, right? So it's their own unique um, environment with their own unique constraints and, and problems that, that they, they may only have because they're a certain type of company in a certain type of space. Um, and, and we need to think about that as we're starting to implement some of these DevOps strategies, right? Um, we need to think about, um, I can give you a step one to 100, right, to go out and, and get DevOps implemented tomorrow. But I think we all know that that, that would probably fail within the first couple of days of trying that. And that's because um, there are things to consider like resources, uh, whether it's money or people or whatever, um, team size, right? Some of you guys work in teams of thousands of people, um, and some of us work in teams of two. So um, we, these are very different scenarios that need to be weighed. Um, the other thing to consider is we're gonna we're gonna fail a lot, anyway, right? Failure is it's, it's gonna happen um, when you go and you're forging the path for a lot of this stuff. There are a lot of opportunities to fall flat on our face. And so, you know, let's, let's acknowledge it. Let's acknowledge those constraints, recognize the fact that we're each individual, and, and recognize that opportunities like this, where we can come together and meet people who are doing this in, in maybe similar organizations, we can bounce things off of and make connections um, and network and start to, to work together on tackling some of these issues. Make sure that you recognize um, and adapt to best fit your needs, because DevOps is not a, a fix-all solution. Okay. So most importantly, successful implementation of DevOps, it's a marathon. Uh, it, you've got to be in it for the long haul, right? You're not going to go into an organization and make DevOps the thing and get it in place this week and have everything run smoothly, and next week be experiencing all of the, the magic that can come with it, right? It takes time. You've got, you've got, there are a lot of new pieces to, to consider. You've got to pace yourself, because um, we are individuals, right? We have one person in the grand scheme of things, and there are a lot of other factors at play. So my encouragement to all of you is to start small. Um, start small, but start, right? Take what you've learned from this, this awesome event that we've all been at, and go back and implement one thing, or two things, and see where it takes you. And then once that works, implement the next thing, and get yourself one more step closer. Um, at the end of the year, chances are you're gonna start seeing quite a bit of impact. So of course, avoid sh shaving acts, right? Avoid it. Stay away from it. I have a couple personal stories. I, I so I run teams. Um, I run IT, and I have recently worked with uh, quality teams who are doing testing on our product as well. And I've actually experienced this recently in both areas. Um, and I was at the root of it. So I am susceptible to changing the eye as much as anyone else. Um, in the IT realm. Um, we get a lot of people asking for stuff, right? Every day, someone, someone's coming in. I get, I get people from every line of the business coming in and going, "Hey, I found a new tool, and it is the tool for us, and we need to get it implemented tomorrow." Right? No one's ever heard that before. We get that all the time. Um, what I found is that that leads to us going in and giving them what they want, not necessarily what they need, but what they want. And then we have to revisit it about four or five times, right? And then we have to go down the rabbit hole, figuring out, okay, is it working? Oh, it's not working? Okay, what do we need to do to make it work? Oh, wait, it's not doing what you want it to do? Can we make it do what you want it to do? Oh, wait, you didn't think about that when you were evaluating this without IT? Um, and so what I've tried to do is I've tried to steer my teams 
away from giving people what they want and start asking questions like, hey, what are you trying to do? What, what is it that you're really striving for here? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and that can be in something like a software request or it can be in something as simple as, hey, my computer's not working, right? You go out there and you fix something and then you find out it's, it's something completely different than what you thought it was. And so you end up revisiting it two or three times. That's shaving the eye. So stay away from that. Try to, try to make sure that we're focusing on the right things. Um, I also had an experience recently where it was a hot fix scenario. Uh, our development team had put out a release that did not go on well. Um, they identified the problem, um, kind of, right? They came in and they said, okay, we have a fix. We're, de we're deploying it to production. It's, it's in production. Everything's good. We removed the code that, that broke it. So, my, you know, that, as someone in quality, my initial reaction is, um, well, so what did you, what did you do? Uh, you know, well, do we know what the problem was? Because you just remove the code, you can actually fix it, right? And so my initial reaction was, hey, let's figure out root cause. We need to figure out why this is a problem and fix that. But the reality is, is, is in these complex systems, um, and, and in these environments where you're dealing with years and years and years of legacy code, that can be a really tedious thing, right? And so sometimes it's better to refocus efforts on back to those pro the, the major problems that we've identified, right? If there's a kind of an agreement that it might be an architectural problem, look at the architectural problems as a whole and fix those instead of fixing the symptoms. So stay away from fixing symptoms, right? Because um, it's like spinning your wheels. Focus on the problems. All right. In conclusion, if you take two things away from this talk. One, be a unicorn, you guys. Unicorns are soft and fluffy, and everybody loves a unicorn. And number two, leave the yacht. Please. Just sleep. Thank you all.